So we'll just wait a few more minutes for a few more people to join. Uh, so for Portelamo, who was asking about the audio, the audio is on, we are working, hopefully you can hear us. Um, we were just muted while we wait for people to join. So we'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. Just testing that you can hear me. Hear you fine, Peter, that's good. Good. So you've got his five minutes. <clears throat> Leave the door open downstairs just in case I need to call you. If you shut the door, you can't hear anything. And have to shout quite loudly for a good hear everything. It's about five miles aside. Okay, we're on five past, so I think we should make a start. Um, so <coughs> welcome everyone to the, uh, the last of the Dara E seminars for this year. Um, hope you all agree we've had a good, had a good run uh, since they were introduced. Uh, and obviously during the lockdown, it's, it's been the, the only way we've been able to keep in touch. So. Uh, many thanks to uh, all the familiar names that I see uh, on, on many of these, um, but also, you know, people are dipping in and out depending on which topics they're interested in. And um, since today, I think uh, quite a few of Peter's Kenyan fan club are, are, are in, uh, so that's, that's also good to see. Um, so it's a, a real pleasure today to welcome uh, Peter back for, uh, so Peter Wilkinson from the University of Manchester uh, for part two of his uh, using the tabletop radio telescope to uh, observe the Milky Way. Uh, so he introduced this topic um, a few seminars ago, and now he's uh, back to uh, tell us about uh, how to actually go about making observations uh, with this device. And, um, and of course, you know, we hope uh, next year that we'll be shipping uh, these devices out to uh, the various DARA participants countries. Um, and so that, you know, hopefully, Next year, you'll also be able to actually get your hands on, on this kit and, and, and have a go for yourself. Okay, so um, I don't think I need to introduce Peter anymore because he's well known to, to many of us. Uh, and, a, and again, a, another firm supporter of the, of the DARA project. So, so welcome Peter and, uh, and take it away. Thanks Melvin. So as you said, uh, number one in this uh, series was um, two, three months ago, and indeed number two should have taken place in October, but uh, many of you may not have known, I was delayed not to illness, but due to a cup of tea, which I spilt over my previous computer and which rendered it useless despite um, people's best efforts at the computer shop. Uh, eventually I had to buy a new computer, get the uh, SSD card read at a significant expense, 
and recover the uh, recover my talk and the observations I've been doing. But anyway, it's all going now. So that's why we're delayed until now. So we're talking about um, uh, making observations with the second, uh, well, making observations with the tabletop radio telescope, uh, as I put in the start here, a project funded by DARA. Before I get uh, into the project itself or the obs actual observations and how we do them, let's just uh, have a few slides, half a dozen slides, just reminding us about what happened in, um, how can I get rid of that at the top of the screen there? Okay. Uh, sorry, I've got to... Uh, 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 you're going going the wrong way. Anyway, let's go. Never mind. The, the titles of each talk I can't see on my screen now, but never mind. Um, I think I know what they are. So, uh, so there are just a few slides about reminding us about e seminar one to get us into our stride. Uh, I said that the uh, the SKA and the TTRT are both inspired by observations of the hydrogen line. Um, so my wife has been helping me there. She's now going to make tea. Uh, the SKA MID is a much bigger telescope, of course, and will be finished uh, towards the end of this decade. That's going to have a geometrical area, including Meerkat, of 35,000 square meters. And one of its goals is to study hydrogen across the universe. The TTRT is a slightly smaller instrument, a geometrical area of 0.07 meters squared, but nevertheless, it's been driven by observing hydrogen, but this case just in the Milky Way on our doorstep. We also said in uh, seminar one, that it's difficult to determine the structure of the Milky Way because we're sitting within the within the, the, the galaxy itself. And indeed, as we know, within the disk. But radio waves penetrate the dust, which you can see on this uh, beautiful picture on the right hand side, this optical picture. And uh, you can see through that dust and make observations of distant reaches of the galaxy, particularly in the 21 centimeter line. But no, uh, we are concentrated on the 21 centimeter line. Reminding ourselves again from seminar number one, radio telescope um, beam picks up emission from clouds at different distances and with different Doppler shifted radio velocities relative to the Earth. So when you point a beam through the galaxy, you see a spectrum that consists of gas clouds spread out in angle and in distance and in velocity. So you get a, a, a composite spectrum of some receding clouds, some approaching clouds, and some clouds moving transversely. And if they're moving transversely, you don't see any Doppler shift, and if you get, get a radial velocity. So that moved me, move that out of the way. <clears throat> now, when people do a big um, hydrogen experiment, you see that the observed radial velocities around the sky, which is this picture here, taken with uh, the biggest telescopes in the world, it's not just a random mess. You can see um, areas where they're all the clouds are all moving in one direction. Uh, green and blue are uh, coherent areas of, of, of motion either towards us or away from us. And what we found, as we said in, uh, in the seminar one, that differential rotation of the galaxy in which the rotation velocity is approximately constant with distance from the center best fits the observations. And we went through how an idealized geometrical model of the Milky Way, assuming stars and gas move in circular orbits about the galactic center with constant velocity with distance yields uh, equations to describe the radial velocity to any galactic longitude, in any particular direction you point through the plane, and or more interestingly, specific equations which describe the maximum radial velocity. Oops, sorry. You will see uh, a particular particular special points called the tangent points. We went through that in, in number one. And almost finally, we introduced all these um, nice idea of um, splitting the galaxy up into various neighborhoods, if you like. Uh, in galactic longitude and latitude, we have the galactic quadrants oops, centered on the sun. They're in uh, quadrants there, you see. Quadrant two is from um, 180 degrees to 90 degrees. Quadrant three is from 270 degrees to 180, etc. 
We have the solar circle, which is the yellow line that uh, defines the orbit which the sun is on. You see, it goes through the spiral arms. The spiral arms uh, are a, a dynamic entity, uh, but then there's the inner galaxy is uh, inside the solar orbit and the outer galaxy is outside the solar orbit. And we showed how, um, because of differential rotation, uh, you can see positive or negative radio velocities in the quadrants and outside the quadrants and outside the solar circle. That was all in seminar one, and it will all be in the, the uh, instruction booklet as well. And finally, <clears throat> we, uh, we talked about, or we showed, uh, pointed out two very nice instructive videos. One was um, this crash course astronomy, uh, particularly number 37 in the series. It's a very lively introduction to our home galaxy, the Milky Way. It's about 10 minutes, packs in an awful lot of information. Then there was a very beautiful three minute video uh, by a French amateur radio astronomer, which showed how you could build up a picture of the Milky Way using the 21 centimeter line, but with a very nice receiving system in his back garden with a three and a half meter, just over 3.3 meter dish. Uh, and they're, they're two very nice videos. So we advise you to go and look at those. So what can we do with the, um, with the TTRT? Now, here it is on the left-hand side. It has very low angular resolution. It's about 40 degrees. And so that means, think, linking back to that earlier slide, that uh, emitting clouds at different uh, distances and different radial velocities are all blended together inside the beam. So you can't pick out the spiral arms that requires a much smaller beam width from a few meter dish, as in that video we just mentioned uh, on the previous slide. That's, you can pick out the spiral arms there. S at the uh, TTRT can't pick out the spiral arms, but you can do something. You can easily detect the hydrogen in the Milky Way. You can see some broad effects of galactic rotation, and you can also demonstrate the concentration of hydrogen that's on the galactic plane. So there's, um, some worthwhile things to see uh, and to do astrophysically. I must point out, so th this is a, a radio astronomy experiment. It's not just like a, an optical telescope where you look at uh, the moons of Jupiter and say, gee, or uh, look at the moon and say, gosh, you can see craters and, uh, and mountains. This is a radio astronomy experiment where you have to do some work to get the results. Um, so you get a real feeling of making some observations, perhaps uh, when we go to Ghana and make observations on the on the big 32 meter telescope. If you've done this experiment um, or yes, if you've done this experiment, you'll gain uh, you'll gain experience of the sort of things you're doing on a, on a professional large scale radio telescope. So I've <clears throat> pointed out here, you have to work carefully and systematically to get good results. And I want people to keep a, a record of your work in a notebook and summarize your results, good and bad, in a short report, a computer report. That's science. You work hard, you write down, and then you uh, extract the results and uh, not just the good ones, because the bad ones is where you learn. So what are the aims of this experiment? <clears throat> Slightly repetitious now, it's fundamentally to gain a basic appreciation of the structure of the Milky Way. You can detect galactic motions with measurements of the spectrum at different positions along the plane. You can demonstrate how the hydrogen intensity falls away very quickly as you move away from the plane. That's the, there. so they're the fundamental astronomical results. <clears throat> but as we were saying, it's not a GWIS experiment, you have to work hard. You gain a basic appreciation of radio astronomy receiving system when you do this experiment and the need to calibrate data. It doesn't just fall out um, as you, you know, take a picture of a, uh, take a picture of the moon and uh, clip it out with uh, on a JPEG. Now you have to work hard to get the results. Well, not too hard, but you have to work. And uh, the third thing is you'll encounter some of the different coordinates, coordinate systems we use in observational astronomy. So what's then the point of this video if, uh, if there's a book of rules? Well, the book of rules um, is quite um, a big document and it could be daunting 
to a student just coming up to it and handing the equipment and handing that book and say, get on with it. <clears throat> By going through this video, it'll be much easier to follow the instruction booklet where all the details are contained. Uh, the, the, um, there's the fine details as to what to do uh, with examples and uh, etc. But this video will give you a big picture version of the instruction booklet and make it hopefully <clears throat> much easier for students, excuse me, let me take a drink, <clears throat> who may have uh, supervision, which is quite limited experience or maybe no experience in radio astronomy, at least initially, to get going. So that's the point of this video. So let's have a look at the system. This is the TTRT system. I explained it last time. It's uh, changed slightly this time, hard, not much though. <clears throat> so we have an antenna here. We have um, what I call the RF box, which we'll go into in a minute, which contains amplifiers, etc. We have uh, a transformer to produce power for the box, 4.5 volts, that plugs into the electrical mains. We have <clears throat> the cable from the box to this um, so-called dongle, RTL, SDR dongle. I'll explain that. <clears throat> That's uh, the critical part of the experiment. That's where the real radio receiver is, that little dongle, which goes into a USB port of your computer. And that's a local Windows PC. We're not handing out laptops everywhere, but uh, any Windows PC, it is Windows, um, uh, really of any age over the last 10 years will work. So that's to control the, uh, the RTL SDR, the dongle plugged into the USB port and to analyze the data. Again, all this is explained in the, in, the, in the handbook, but if we go through it in this video, it'll make people much more confident to plunge into the handbook. Oh, we also need one more thing, is because you have to calibrate the data, you need what's called an RF load, which is a reference signal, source of reference noise. Really, it's just a, um, a resistor encapsulated in this uh, metal cage, and you plug that onto there, which we'll go to in a minute. But that's the, that's the reference source to tell you a reference signal strength. So let's get going. What you want to do, it's a tabletop radio telescope. So we want to mount it on a, a sturdy and level table, um, a little bit bigger than some of the tables I've been using. It's, we want to be able to spread out the equipment and the laptop. Uh, it's critical that you don't make it out of steel or magnetic material because you want to point the telescope with a compass, probably. So you don't want magnetic compasses affected by a lot of steel around. Uh, be careful with safety. It's, the actual antenna is uh, an equipment only operates on four volts, but you do need a commercial transformer unit, which we supply to put uh, 4.5 volts into the, into the RF box, but that's a commercial uh, device. That should be okay. And you'll probably want uh, uh, your transformer to plug into your laptop. So you need to have a proper outdoor access to mains power, maybe by a, a long cable, of course, but it should be a properly constituted cable. Uh, and don't observe in rainy, wet or damp conditions. Actually, if you, it, uh, it, it can affect the, the, the receiver as well. So largely, but not entirely uh, where you are, it's probably going to be not wet, but of course it does rain in Africa. Of course it does. Anyway, observe in the dry. An uh, interesting, interesting practical point, um, which even is necessary at Jodrell Bank, is that <clears throat> you're most, most likely to be observing in a sunny day, and uh, it can be difficult to see the laptop screen out in the, in the bright sunlight. So my trick is always to <clears throat> put the laptop inside a cardboard box mounted on its side like that. <clears throat> and that acts as a very nice um, uh, sunshade. Just be careful not to strain the connectors around here. But if you make a nice big cardboard, a nice big cardboard box like this, <clears throat> that's ideal from uh, hiding you from the bright sunlight. So let's make a plunge into the system. This is the receiving system, the antenna. It's fundamentally a, a can at the bottom. It is literally, actually you can make them and I will be making them out of food cans. Food cans uh, are all 
of this size, six inches across. <clears throat> actually, they call them now 15.2 centimeters, but they're actually six inches across. And it's a can with a hole drilled in the side and a little um, wire connected in the other side <clears throat> of carefully chosen height above the bottom and length. So it picks up radiation uh, tuned to the hydrogen line at 1420 megahertz. That will all be done. I will do that myself because I'm going to make 20 of these. On top of this, <clears throat> to make it a, a better antenna, I've attached a horn extension, which is actually a piece of air conditioning duct, which just happens to be exactly the right size here and spreads out here <clears throat> to give you a larger collecting area. Um, it, in, it decreases the um, size of the main beam. It makes the beam narrower. It's still about 40 degrees, mind you. That's uh, a plot of the beam or the reception pattern as a function of angle. <clears throat> here's 180 degrees here, here's naught degrees. So it's about slightly under 40 degrees across. So it, it picks up over quite a big area. Notice, by the way, that significant amounts of power are also picked up from the back lobes. That's actually behind the dish. So it, these things pick up radiation from behind you. And the side lobes, and they pick up radiation from the sides. So it's not all from straight in front. Power leaks in all around. And we'll, uh, as we come to the end, we'll see the effect of that. What's in the box? Well, you won't see that I've just taken the top off. You have the connector on the end where you put connect to the uh, antenna or the, the, the load. Inside, we have two amplifiers to amplify the, uh, the signal from uh, the cosmos. Uh, we have an output to the, um, to the dongle. Uh, here's the 4.5 volts input. Uh, we have a little smoothing capacitor because these cheap power supplies have a bit of hum on them. So you put a little capacitor in there to uh, get rid of that. Then perhaps the most important thing that was actually the most expensive is extremely good radio frequency filter, which cuts out the radiation, particularly from mobile phones. So this plot here um, is power loss down the side against frequency along the bottom. And up here, there's almost no power loss in a band around the 21 centimeter line. And then it, more and more power is lost towards the sides. And uh, it's 60 dB down. I'll explain that on the next slide, which is a factor of a million at um, a frequency of 1.4. 1.6 gigahertz. Now the mobile phone is further away, so this cuts out the mobile phone signals, which would normally swamp the receivers uh, very well. So this is a critical piece of the kit. Just a, a little aside, um, decibels, we will use decibels a lot in the script. Radio engineers, and in fact other people, audio engineers, uh, use decibels because of the wide range of powers you encounter. So you often re uh, encounter ranges of millions or more, and it, you don't want to keep saying that all the time. So you, you express the ratio of two powers logarithmically. So if you have powers P1 and P2, it's 10 times the log of P1 over P2. So if P1 is 100 and P2 is 1, then P1 is 20 dBs, because the log of 100 is 2, well, you multiply by 10 to make it a bigger number, <clears throat> plus 20 dBs compared to P1. If it's the other way around, then P1 is minus 20 dBs compared to P2. So we use logs, this logarithmic decibel scale a lot. Um, incidentally, the amplifier's gain <clears throat> in that box there is well over 50 dBs, which really means that the output power is more than 100,000 times, 10 to the 5 times the input power. Now, the critical part of the experiment is so-called software-defined radio, <clears throat> which is this little dongle. And that replaces some of the components of a classical receiver with um, integrated hardware under software control, software-defined radio. Um, incidentally, there's a very good overview, a general overview given in this um, uh, SD, this uh, URL at the bottom. That's a very good uh, 
if you want to find out about software defined radio, nicely explained, uh, go there. <clears throat> so that's this dongle here. There are many different types of dongle. I was using one of those, but I've now settled on this one here. Uh, it fits directly, they all have the same chips inside them. It fits directly into a USB port here. Uh, and this is, uh, this connector goes via a cable to the RF box. Uh, a continuous stream of voltages come into this end here and are amplified and turned, further amplified and turned to digi digital signals here and read into the computer. The beautiful thing is the, all the data collection parameters, uh, the receiver can be controlled <clears throat> by your PC and the digitizer, digitized data manipulated in software again on the PC. So this is the critical component. <clears throat> um, they're quite cheap. These ones here can be bought for about uh, $15. These slightly better ones, which are seriously better and fit our equipment better, and would more long last cost about $25, I think. Uh, you need some software, and I'm not going to go into this in detail here because uh, it's explained in the package in the, in the book of rules, in the script, but there are four different software packages you need, but uh, you'll soon get used to it. <clears throat> First of all, we have something called the Zadig driver. That's basically um, because the PC needs to be told how to communicate with the dongle, the RTLSDR. So you have this driver, which you load onto your computer and uh, with a few clicks uh, on a, a GUI, you can uh, load up the driver to tell it to communicate with the, that new uh, component in that USB port. You only need that once on initial startup. Indeed, if it's a computer which is used for this experiment a lot, somebody may have done it already for you. That's just something you need once. Uh, then we have some data for testing and taking the data, which has been supplied by this uh, open source community, the Open Source Mobile Communications Consortium, Osmocon. <clears throat> and they provide a range of software for interacting with the machine. We only use two of their library. We have a program called rtltest.exe, and that just tests that you've, uh, you can talk to the, the uh, to the, to the dongle from your PC. And we use that just once at startup. And then we have the main program, RTL underscore SDR.exe, and that takes the digital data. That's the data taking program, which you can control. And we use that throughout the experiment. We have some analysis tools, and I've got some uh, um, acknowledgements as who's done all this at the end. We have two programs one of which is again just used in the startup phase testing radio astronomy receivers need testing and that compiles statistics about how well the dongle is working then we have the main program the fourier transform program and that calculates the spectrum of the power coming through the, uh, the dongle and we use that throughout so we fundamentally use two programs the data taking and the uh, spectrum calculator with an FFT. The other programs are used for setup and testing. Oh, by the way, we also have a coordinate converter. Uh, to make it easy for you, I've had, uh, I had a couple of students, particularly one student, writing a program that uh, enables you to point anywhere on the galaxy and tells you <clears throat> what the azimuth and elevation are for any given location, observing time and date. We'll come on to that. So that's those are all on a, a, they'll all come in a pen drive and you'll copy them onto your onto your um, PC, may have been done already, into a working directory, and you can control everything from there. The local PC should also have some spreadsheet program. Many of them will. Uh, I use Excel, but any open source equivalent because it's not doing anything very complicated. It's reading in some simple text data and uh, doing some very simple manipulations, all explained in the in the book. So, right, let's get started. What do you do? You plug in the uh, dongle into one of the USB ports, run this Zadig program as per instructions, and then test whether you can uh, see the dongle, confirm the PC recognizing it. Uh, incidentally, um, perhaps unusually, some of you won't be used to this, 
all these uh, programs are run via what's called the command line. It's a text-based instruction. It's all, not all, not everything in radio astronomy is done by GUIs, graphical user interfaces. You type some text in and something happens and you read it into the spreadsheet. It's still a common style in research astronomy to use text-based instructions. So <clears throat> here's an example of what you'll do if you get, what you'll see if you run one of these, uh, the test program. Here it, you've been running, here's the command line window. You're told exactly how to do this in, get this going in Windows, command.exe. Here's the program, we pack that in and then it says, oh yes, it comes back at you. Oh, I recognize the unit and the tuner chip. There's the, uh, the unit and that's the tuner chip. Um, here are all the gain values I have on my um, amplifier inside the chip, 29 of them. You can choose any one of those. Um, here's the um, sampling rate you've asked me, or this is no sampling rate I'm default setting. We can change that. Uh, <clears throat> then it tells you it's reading some data and testing it. Uh, it always says it's missing a few bits of data, but you haven't got to worry about it. Anyway, you run this program, and if you see this sort of output, then you know they're working fine. Then, continuing the testing, <clears throat> we uh, radio astronomy deals with random noise. Here's some random noise, time along the bottom, amplitude along the top, just looks like hiss. <clears throat> so the receiver chain produces these random noise voltages, a mean of zero, and it's got some Gaussian distribution of amplitudes. So it's got to sample those, digitized in the RTL SDR. And in order to be able to make maximum use of this noise, you've got to set the overall receiver gain, which is a combination of the amplifiers in the RF box. We so that, so or earlier and those in the SDR itself because there's amplifiers inside that little dongle and you've got the you've got to get the combination exactly optimized to make use of the digitizer in the system properly so what you do is you want to do that with the strongest signal you're going to see and the strongest signal you're going to see is when you connect this load to the box here because that's at a temperature of ambient temperature about 300 Kelvin, whereas the sky you'll find, we we'll say later, is much colder. <clears throat> so you want to be able to test it with that plugged on. So we connect that up. And one of the first things you'll find is it's a bit of a fiddle, or I'm so used to it, I do it easily now, but to connect that, uh, those so-called type N connectors up, you, uh, you align them carefully, push them together and screw. And a uh, bit of bread practice, you can do that very quickly. And you end up with the, with the uh, RF load screwed onto the front of this box. So that's the reference signal coming through. That resistor in there at room temperature produces noise of a very well-defined amplitude because it's related to its physical temperature. Right, so then we've got to, to uh, set this gain. So we, for the first time we use this data taking program, rtlsdr.exe, and we capture digital data from this dongle. And that writes a binary file, those are ones and zeros, into the working area on your PC. <clears throat> so here's what you type in. You type in on the command line window, program.exe, dot slash, file name one dot bin. This is very much like often how you interact with the real uh, radio astronomy uh, professional data. You don't bother to have a, a GUI window. Minus frequency tells you the frequency you want to do, 1420.4 megahertz. E6 is 10 to the six. The sampling rate is 2048 E3, 2048 kilohertz or 2048, 2.048 megahertz. The gain you want to set for the dongle is 22.9 dBs. And the length of number of samples you want to take is 2 million, 2 times 10 to the 6. And that turns out to be about a second's worth of data. So here they all are. These what these are. 
an output file name, the frequency, the sample rate, the gain, the number of samples. Most of these don't change. The only thing that tends to change is you tend to change the file name and often this gain, which might be something different from that, but basically you change the file name and the sampling rate. I'm the, sorry, the number of samples. You keep the frequency and the sampling rate the same and the gain the same. So you just change that and that <clears throat> from one to another. So it rapidly becomes a very straightforward thing to do once you've done it for the first time. And here this is what the output of this program looks like. Here I've uh, typed the program in. Here's all the entries I've made as on the previous slide. And it confirms, comes back and confirms the settings there. Um, here's a frequency, here's a sampling rate, here's the gain set to 22.9 dB. And uh, it sits there taking data for however long you want. This is for one second, it comes back quite quickly end of the program and now it finishes when the required number of samples has been collected <clears throat> and then it will be waiting for the next run. So what you do is you take several sets of data to find out if you've got the gain right, um, several sets of gain of uh, data with gain settings, which are these ones here, um, around uh, in, in, the, uh, in the range around the middle of uh, this, I'm gonna go back here. I'm sorry, oh, sorry, of the middle of the range uh, we saw earlier on. I don't want to go too back too far. Uh, so you want to try several examples of gain and use one second integration to speed things up. Then you read it into this um, statistic program we only use this once or a couple of times at the beginning <clears throat> to assemble the amplitude statistics. How well is the sampler? How well is the um, digitizer working? And you read those into a PC, which is very simple. It's just a little text file, a couple of columns, read it into any simple spreadsheet. Then you can plot them out. And here are three examples setting the checking, checking the gain. Here, the statistics, the, the histogram, uh, these are digitizer channels against counts. Um, everything is concentrated in the small numbers of counts. The receiver gain is too low. <clears throat> here the receiver gain is too high, it's saturating at the ends here, look. Too big an amplitude range. This one is where it's just right. Uh, and the full amplitude range has been utilized, you should stick to this value. So this is another test. You've got to check up that your receiver is properly uh, constituted and you've um, ensured that the gain and therefore the digitization level is just right. This will be, you do this in a real experiment or it will be done for you, but then you'd realize how, care, how important it is to do this properly. You will do this for yourself. <clears throat> the final thing before we get going is that power from the receiver is a function of frequency. It's called the output spectrum. And when you point it towards the sky, uh, the output spectrum is a combination of emission from the sky, including the hydrogen line, and the spectral response of the receiver chain. So you get them both together. So in order to see the sky spectrum, you've got to remove the effect of the receiver chain. So you have to take a test receiver spectrum. How do you do that? Well, you take a spectrum with that RF load, which we talked about earlier, still connected. So you take some data with the standard program you'll use over and over again. You can use a short integration time. <clears throat> you read those data into your computer. Then you, in the computer, you use this spectrum program, RFFD22.exe. And this is what you get out of it. Here's the program. You put all it is, you put a file name in, a file name out, and you tell it to do 256 channels. And it will come back to you very quickly. Right, I've written 256 points in that out file. And that's the output. It takes the Fourier transform, forms the spectrum. And you read that into the spreadsheet. Again, it, once you get going, you'll do this very quickly. Because I've had students doing this experiment and they get going very quickly. And you see a spectrum like this. This is the FFT channel number. 
So this is really a frequency along the bottom <clears throat> in channel number. And this is a frequency band of 2.048 megahertz, <clears throat> 2048 kilohertz, and power up the side. So this is the spectrum you might receive. And you might say, well, that's a funny looking thing. It's all wibbly wobbly. Well, it is because that's the filter characteristics in the receiver itself. It's not the filter characteristics in the RF box. That's much better than that and a much broader band. This is the filter characteristics inside the little dongle. So we've got to get rid of that. Uh, interestingly, the power level up the side here is directly proportional here at the top here to the physical temperature of that load. So that enables us, which is very important, to calibrate our eventual sky spectrum in terms of temperature. More of this is explained in the handbook, but it's vital to do this comparison load. NB, this test spectrum is a bit noisy. We're gonna use a longer integration time when we get going. So we do this with a one second integration, um, <clears throat> just to make it quick. Right, well now all the hardware is now set up. Now let's take some data. Well, where do we point the data? Where do we point the telescope? <clears throat> you have to worry about um, the coordinate systems on the sky. The handbook explains um, three different coordinate systems. I've written some, uh, some of you may know this already, but I've written some explanatory notes. Uh, we have celestial coordinates, which is sort of like longitude and latitude in the sky as seen from the earth. We have galactic lo uh, coordinates, longitude and latitude with respect to the sun and the plane of the galaxy, galactic coordinates. Then we have the local horizon coordinates, where you are on the Earth. That's your azimuth, which is really the compass bearing, <coughs> and elevation pointing up from the horizon. And there are web links on there to explain all those. Now, astronomers describe positions in for discrete objects in terms of right ascension and declination. And we point telescopes in azimuth and elevation. So you need a a coordinate conversion from right ascension and declination to azimuth and elevation. All telescopes will have those, of course. Uh, we want to point the TTRT antenna to positions in the Milky Way. And so we require an ASL coordinate conversion software. <clears throat> now, you can sort of do that, cobble that together from the web, but to make life easier and less uh, have less scope for getting confused, we've written um, our own conversion software. Before we do that, let's just uh, think about the sky here. This is the sky, the sphere of the sky expressed in a rectangular grid of right ascension there and declination. So hours of right ascension and degrees of declination. This is all explained in the handbook, but on top of it is plotted galactic coordinates. Uh, the plane of the Milky Way is highlighted in yellow. And that's where we'll be pointing most of the time. We'll be pointing our antenna towards those directions. <clears throat> but there are other notable directions, particularly the North Galactic, oh, sorry, the North Galactic Pole here. She's pointing straight up out of the galaxy, pointing from the galactic center and upwards. Oh, sorry, pointing from, pointing upwards. And South Galactic Pole pointing downwards. That's where the galaxy in hydrogen is very cold. The galaxy is hottest along the galactic plane. That's just a description, um, but we don't have to look at that. We use a coordinate converter, which you are supplied with. I've had uh, a student with a helper writing this coordinate conversion program. This one does run uh, via a um, graphical user interface. <clears throat> so you'll click on this. And uh, here's an example. Here's I've got, uh, this is from my house. Uh, I wanted to point at galactic latitude, longitude, 80 degrees. Galactic latitude zero, that's on the plane. Uh, my house is at, um, we don't put super accurate positions in here because it's not necessary with such a big beam. Uh, my longitude is 357.8. The longitude is eastward pointing. So the, I'm west of the uh, Greenwich Meridian. So you could say I was minus 2.2 degrees east or 2.2 degrees west. Anyway, that means 357.8. Uh, 
um, <clears throat> Africa is tends to be a little on the east side, but uh, anyway, easy enough. My latitude is 53.3. It could be minus. I will see that in a minute. Um, uh, you put in uh, what's the offset of your local time from Greenwich Mean Time. This was I did this in the summer where we were one degree one hour off for summertime. Uh, this is the year. Uh, the student didn't bother to put 2020, uh, so it assumes you're in the the 21st century. So 20 means a year 2020 is the month October, uh, day 10th of October, and then the time local time. This is your local time, civil time. This was six o'clock in the evening, 18 hours, no minutes, no seconds. You press run, and up pops um, um, a little window here, telling you. Uh, what the right ascension and declination of that galactic position is, and you can check that against the previous slide. But more importantly, it tells you that that galactic longitude and latitude at that point in time and at that date uh, will be at azimuth 103, elevation 63. That's the critical. So that's where to point the antenna. Then you press OK, and that finishes, and you could do another one. <clears throat> so to start off, you've got to find out which parts of the plane are accessible. And that means above elevation at least 30 degrees, because uh, because the beam's big, we're going to see as towards the end, if you point it lower than that, you tend to pick up too much radiation from the ground. So you run the coordinate calculator and explore ranges of longitude, galactic longitude, and time of day for the given date, because initially we're talking about the galactic plane, so we're always assuming B, galactic latitude, zero. And you've got to find the favorable positions to observe. <clears throat> so to make this easy, I've, uh, I did this for a position <clears throat> close to Nairobi, and I've uh, collected all the results together in an Excel file, um, which I've also included uh, 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 with a, I've also put it on a, a Word document. Um, called Nairobi three month positions XLXS, but it's also in a Word document in the in the uh, book of rules to explain what you can do. And as a check, uh, students should make sure you can reproduce a few of these results. So let's show what I did. Uh, this looks a bit complicated to start off with, but uh, I'll uh, dig into it as we go along. So I did positions for Nairobi which is longitude plus 37, i.e. east of Greenwich, latitude minus one, just below the equator. <clears throat> and I did it for a local time of um, UT plus three hours. Because Nairobi time is typically three hours after Greenwich mean time. And it's all for galactic latitude zero on the plane. I did it for 09 hours local time and I did it for four different dates. And what happens, of course, is at different dates, the sky moves. So where you see the galactic plane, a particular point on one month won't be where it is the next month. So I did it for four different dates here and yellow were elevations close to or above 30 degrees. Well, that's all a bit complicated. Let's just focus on, on one day, this day here, the 1st of September, 2019, here's, longitudes and here's the azimuth and elevations for nine o'clock. Let's get rid of all these other ones <clears throat> and see here, put these dotted lines in, galactic longitudes at 105 in here to about 215 were suitably placed for viewing at 9 a.m. on the 1st of September 2019, at least as regards elevation, because you have to know what direction uh, you're pointing in azimuth as well, so they will be, that's towards the north, and this is towards the south. So uh, these are azimuth and elevations which are suitable. You'll have to work out whether your site can see these directions. Uh, then for 12 hours local time, the skies moved around a little bit, and longitudes 135 to 230 were okay at 12 noon. Anyway, you now know where to point. You can, uh, again, more explanations in the book, but that uh, that tells you what to do. It's a very useful um, um, GUI for the uh, galactic coordinates conversion.
Okay, well, let's get in towards it now. Uh, this is me connecting the, um, having unscrewed the load, connecting the RF box onto the antenna. <clears throat> you can tell this, I took this picture just uh, about a week ago. It was cold in England, so I've got my coat on. You can see the leaves in my garden, um, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, this is what you'll do. You connect the RF box onto the antenna like this. Again, with a bit of practice, it becomes quite easy to do it and screw it onto the antenna. <clears throat> We're setting up now. Uh, I've left the mounting of the antenna up to as, as you as a local challenge. It turned out that uh, we had in our house this little stool here, very small stool. You can see that's probably about, um, I don't know, 15, 20 centimeters long there. <clears throat> and its legs, uh, the, it, fit, it fitted very nicely into there and it, it enabled you to point the uh, antenna at uh, different uh, elevations quite easily. And since this is a bit of weight here, it, uh, it somehow held the antenna very nicely. So what you will be sent is, you won't be sent that stool. You may have to make such a thing or um, you may invent a more sophisticated method. Anyway, I found this was perfectly adequate. Remember, this has got quite a big beam here. So you're not pointing it to a degree. How do you point the antenna? Well, in azimuth, the simplest way to use is standard magnetic compass. You have to be a bit careful, uh, particularly in South Africa, to find out the difference between the geographic and magnetic poles at your declination, more at your location. It's called the magnetic declination. So the magnetic pole is not necessarily at the geographic pole, and there is it depends, the difference between them varies over the Earth's surface. You can use a smartphone compass app, app. that's quite nice, but again they're mainly magnetic and I, one of the reasons uh, I got confused uh, a month or two ago trying to do this, um, A, you've got to calibrate the sensor, you wave it around a bit, but be careful to avoid a phone case if it's got a magnetic fastener, which mine did. So no wonder my um, app wasn't giving the right answer because it <coughs> had a little magnet waving around near the <coughs> near the sensor. So be careful if you're trying to use a smartphone, don't use a case of the magnetic sensor. A very good tip to make sure you get it right is to use Google Earth Pro, which is a free download. <coughs> and you can use the ruler in that to draw a line from your observing point to a recognizable point some distance away. And that gives you a very accurate check that you understand your smartphone or you understand your compass bearing. So use a ruler in Google Earth Po, that's the thing there. So I drew a line between a corner of a concrete, this is Jodrell Bank viewed from above. Um, and I drew a line from a corner of a concrete pad there to the corner of a building there. And that comes up here exactly azimuth 348.44 degrees. We've tested that by other means and it's very accurate. So you can trust this. So you can uh, draw a line somewhere near you and make sure that your compass bearing uh, agrees with that to a few degrees. As long as it's within a few degrees, that's fine. Or your smartphone gives the same answer. But this is a very good check. Elevation. Um, I have a nice little uh, pair of steel compasses, steel rulers, which give the angle between them like that. They only cost a few pounds, those. <clears throat> or an even simpler thing, which I drew on a card, piece of cardboard, uh, you can draw out uh, a protractor there every 10 degrees. And it's quite easy with that to position the antenna to about five degrees, which is really all you need to do. <clears throat> so a low cost protractor or if, uh, if your lab has that, well, that's fine. So you point it in azimuth with a compass and elevation of the protractor. Or you can have a smartphone app again showing the tilt angle. That doesn't worry about the magnetic compass, I don't think. Now, this is the first reason why you're likely to get funny results. Incorrect pointing. Check, 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 check. You need to align the antenna to at least 10 degrees, but preferably five degrees of the calculated directions you get from the uh, from that little um, application 
galactic coordinate uh, calculator <coughs> to Azel. And I advise that two people should independently check the Azel. Right, we're there. We now take data from the sky. So you point the antenna at the sky, uh, galactic coordinates you want to do, chosen longitude. And uh, one second is a bit too short. I'm suggesting you take an integration time of 49 seconds, which is uh, used minus N1, that's 10, um, what, uh, 100 million samples, 100 million samples. Then you take the spectrum using this FFT program, as explained before and in the script, and you plot the output text file using a spreadsheet and you get a spectrum. Oh, you look at it and they said, well, that's, well, that's a very funny looking thing. That wibbly line looks very similar to what I had before, doesn't it? Well, it's true because most of that wibbly line is caused by the response of the receiver. That's why we have to take a receiver spectrum against a known reference to be able to get rid of it. Actually, you'll find that uh, it's sloping down a little bit and there's a little bit of a knob there. All right, well, that doesn't look very impressive, does it? But we're getting there. So what you then do is you disconnect the antenna and you reconnect the RF load to the RF box and take that reference spectrum <coughs> using the same integration time. That's pretty critical, 49 seconds. So you always have to have a spectrum from the sky and a comparison load spectrum because you've got to divide one by the other. <clears throat> and you do that in a, in a spreadsheet. It's just very, again, you have a column of numbers, two columns of numbers, and you third, form a third column, which is one divided by the other. It's very simple. Uh, again, explained in the, in the appendix in the handout, but uh, you will find that very easy. Nothing complicated in the spreadsheet, it's just dealing with, with uh, text files. Simple comma separated variables. <clears throat> and then you can get the divided is the sky power corrected, normalized with respect to the load. So you have the raw sky spectrum, what we've just seen, the RF load spectrum, divide that by that. And what do you get? Well, it's a bit funny, but this big bump in the middle is hydrogen. I'll explain about why that it looks uh, slightly odd in uh, the next slide, but that lump there is hydrogen. And when you see a big lump near the middle, as you should do, you can congratulate yourself because uh, you'll have observed a 21 cent emission from vast numbers of hydrogen atoms in our galaxy, which uh, emitted their radiation thousands of years ago because our galaxy is many thousands of light years across. They've been traveling ever since only a minuscule fraction were lucky enough to hit your tiny antenna just at the right time. By the way, this isn't a, a working model of the Milky Way. Well, we haven't quite finished yet because it wasn't a gee whiz point and shoot. That You didn't just say, oh, there's hydrogen. We want to do something more quantitative. So we have to convert the axes into practical units. And uh, it turns out all you have to do is multiply the um, frequency channel, which comes out from the uh, FFT program by uh, 1.69, actually minus 1.69 to flip things around, <clears throat> to change it from channel number to radial velocity in kilometers per second. And the vertical axis, the power, you just have to multiply that ratio, the ratio of the load, to the sky to the load, by the temperature of the RF load, which will be typically room temperature, 290 degrees, possibly in the UK, maybe 300 degrees or more in Africa. So you, there's some, just a couple of simple multiplicative conversions you do. And then you've got a real radio astronomy spectrum. <clears throat> and this is it. A real Now your spectrum at the bottom is in terms of radial velocity, Doppler shifted velocity along the line of sight to the Earth. And it's in terms of radio astronomy brightness temperature. Here, 95 degrees to 125 degrees. Here's the hydrogen line. <clears throat> and you'll say, well, this is a funny looking spectrum. <clears throat> First of all, you can ignore anything near the edges because this, uh, this system tends to have funny results 
when it's uh, when it's got a, a sharp change in frequency near the edges, you can ignore anything near the band edges um, here and here because hydrogen never comes there. Then the second confusion, it looks like a slope, doesn't it? <clears throat> and that turns out to be, hopefully that'll be better in the final versions, but it's imper imperfect, what we call impedance matching in the prototype antenna. <clears throat> when I've put the, um, excuse me, <clears throat> when I've put the ice cream cone on the top, <clears throat> it affects the, uh, the matching ever so slightly. And I have to tweak that <clears throat> in the final version. Um, it's actually quite easy to remove that slope uh, in the spreadsheet. You could just subtract away a linear slope. Uh, but you don't need to do that. The basic results are obtainable without doing that. And I think the slope in the final version will be much uh, less than that. But here we are. I've actually taken out the, uh, the um, <coughs> I've taken out that slope. And here's a hydrogen spectrum. Um, we'll come to that in a, where it is in a minute. Um, we see it stands out quite a uh, good signal to noise ratio, even with just 49 seconds integration. So what I suggest you do then is uh, explore different integration times, but I'm suggesting you try one four times longer, which is 196 seconds to improve the noise level. But remember, you always have to take a comparison spectrum with the same time scale. So they always have to, you always have to take a separate spectrum if you change the integration time. Uh, you correct and plot the spectrum as for the previous data, uh, and there's the previous spectrum. And here's a better spectrum with improved signal to noise ratio. You can see the noise here and the noise here are better and it stands out better. And here's the corrected spectrum. <clears throat> and I've now put on where it's from. This is from the galactic longitude 180 degrees, which is the galactic anticenter, the direction exactly opposite to the galactic center direction. And it has a beautiful strong line here. Um, there is residual baseline curvature. I'm, I say, I'm hoping to improve that. You could further correct that. People, generations of research students have uh, corrected baselines in research level data uh, by subtracting away um, linear fits and parabolic fits and other polynomials. But it doesn't really matter. You can see the results without doing that. Uh, for here, because it's a galactic anticenter, you'll find the radial velocity is concentrated around zero. Because at the galactic anticenter, all the motions with respect to us are transverse. So you don't get much radial velocity, uh, positive or negative. Um, <clears throat> the size of the line here is about 9.5 Kelvin. And the width here, now compared to a, um, a high resolution professional result, <clears throat> both the line width has increased and the height is diminished because the TTRP T beam is very big and you're picking up emission from an extended region, of course, not just in this exact direction of 180 degrees and latitude zero. You're picking it from either side of it uh, along the plane and off the plane where the signal is weaker. <clears throat> so there you get some good signal to noise ratio. Um, you don't get such clear cut results, of course, as if you'd looked at it with the uh, with the Jodrell Bank telescope or the Ethelsberg telescope or even a three meter telescope, but it's good enough to make the point we're trying to make. So the, the experiment then is to take sky structure for a, a range of um, longitudes as time allows, um, three or four, I would hope. You choose your own integration time. Uh, it might be interesting if you can arrange safely to observe outside the working day and you can see different parts of the plane. And the, the question is to see how the spectrum shifts and changes shape due to the differential rotation of the galaxy. I've just shown you one spectrum there. And the script asks you to comment on how these change based on the explanations <coughs> in the e seminar one and the script. Here are a few different ones. Here's uh, lat longitude 80, latitude zero. And you will immediately notice the noise level here isn't quite so good. Around my house is full of trees. 
and I was taking these data in uh, uh, within the last few weeks, so it's been wet. So looking through wet trees is not good. <clears throat> and I'll come to uh, nearly finish now. Come to uh, comparing this these different spectra. Um, here's a professional smooth uh, professional spectrum, smooth to about half our resolution. Um, you can see how it's narrower, but you can see this. The main point is that you see this emission here. Um, so going back to the spectrum, so this is approaching gas and this is transversely moving gas. As I say, this spectrum isn't as good a quality as the earlier one. I've, I've kept this on deliberately to indicate different, uh, different qualities of spectrum. We're nearly there now. Uh, the last thing you're asked to do is to observe away from the plane at high galactic latitudes near the galactic poles. And you should find that the signal there is very, very much weaker than it is on the plane, which is just a demonstration. Um, I've asked a comment where you find I've told you, you'll find a weaker signal uh, that um, the plane is uh, where all the hydrogen is concentrated. Uh, just a few final simple practical points. Uh, maintain stable conditions. Don't let things heat up too much. But the main point I wanted to make is your environment matters. Important where you point the telescope. That's the second main reason for getting confusing data. <clears throat> because your surroundings on the Earth are much hotter than the sky. And they're going to, because you pick up information uh, if not pick up, you pick up random noise through the side lobes. Um, and if you point the beam in the wrong direction, you can increase the random noise and you can decrease the signal. Looking through trees is a particularly bad idea. So avoid pointing directions close to walls and through trees. Avoid elevations below 30 degrees to minimize power pickup from the ground. And which students get excited um, and uh, ask you questions, don't walk in front of the antenna while taking data, because you are also at 300 degrees. I've made a little cartoon of this. So here's a telescope on the table. It's got quite a wide beam width. Here's radiation coming in from the sky. The sky is cold, minus less than 10 degrees. The ground is hot, 300 degrees. Ground radiation leaks in via the back lobes and via the side lobes. So it's always uh, worse noise than you would hope, because the antenna isn't uh, is a cheap one, but it's good enough. Don't point through trees, because the main beam will intercept the hot trees and also reduce the signal. Let the telescope point near walls, because the main beam will uh, intercept the wall and pick up a lot of hot radiation from the wall, and the wall will also leak in via the side lobes. So you want a clear line of sight, if at all possible. And don't let excited students bounce in front of the antenna. Tell them to go away. Uh, finally, now, let's uh, just see some example spectra. Um, example A, I showed you all these spectra, is a good quality spectrum. Notice that the brightness temperature around the line is about uh, 110 Kelvin. And that's a really nice spectrum. Probably as good as you're going to get. Here's the one I showed at uh, Latitude, these are different latitudes, longitudes rather, latitude 80 here, the one I showed you, and that's a medium quality spectrum. <clears throat> you can see the shoulder on the line there, but notice that the brightness temperature here not, is not 110, it's 149. There's more radiation coming through, so there's hot surroundings getting in the way, and it's making the spectrum harder to interpret. This one's just about okay, um, but the noise is notably worse. <clears throat> and here's one which is only fair to poor quality, latitude 50. Actually, we're supposed to be able to see some stuff over here, but the noise is much worse. Look, it's 185, so much more radiation coming in. I'm probably looking for a tree here as well. So this, I would regard this as a poor quality spectrum. So uh, always try to point away from things which are hot or reduce the signal. So you're then asked to write a short introduction, a short uh, report. Um, I won't bother to go through that, uh, but 
writing up your results is absolutely vital because it focuses you on what you've learned. Um, you don't want to just write up the good stuff, show where you went wrong, what did you learn, what did you gain from this experiment, and indeed we'd love to know how you might improve it, particularly how the script is written. I'm sure you'll have a, um, advice on that. Uh, there are a few other things in the script for people who get really enthousi enthusiastic. There's some optional work. There's a, a nice way to test the radiometer equation, which is in fundamental radio astronomy, using the uh, <clears throat> using the hot load. And you can test that the radiometer equation uh, is correct. Uh, there's some hydrogen spectra in there, professional spectra, which you can use to construct the rotation curve of the uh, inner galaxy. Then you're also asked about the distribution of dark matter around the Milky Way. <clears throat> so there's more to the script than uh, this, just taking some data, but you don't have to do it. That's optional work. And I also tell you some websites which uh, you can look at to let you take or download higher resolution data. I can't finish without some acknowledgements. Um, I'm indebted to quite a few people. Um, a professional colleague, Mr. Peter East, who was the uh, chief technical officer of a, a very major UK um, um, military electronic company uh, in his retirement uh, provided the basis of the receiver design, although I've changed it somewhat, but particularly he wrote the data analysis tools um, for the RT. So the, um, the Fourier transform program and the statistics program. I've had two generations of students um, developing this earlier versions, uh, messier versions of this uh, experiment. And I've also had last year a couple of students who wrote, which is not completely trivial, uh, the Galactic to Azale coordinate transformation software, and we tested it out in great detail. So everybody in science is uh, using the work of other people. So never be, never be not frightened, but always acknowledge uh, your helpers. So I've finished. Enjoy making your first hands-on radio astronomy observations. If if and when you get hold of this kit. But first, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Peter, for uh, an excellent overview of uh, this fine piece of kit. And, and really many, many thanks for, for doing this and um, putting it all together and uh, getting it to this stage. And uh, I'm sure uh, the students will be uh, very keen to get their hands on this uh, piece of kit literally and uh, and do do the work uh, themselves that'd be uh, yeah, it's, um, the bad point is it's a real radio astronomy experiment you have to uh, you have to go through the processes that you go through uh, in taking some professional data you don't just point it and say wow no absolutely that's oh, really good um so we've got a few questions in on the q a box already but um anyone's got any questions please just type them into the q a box and i'll uh, I'll allow you to unmute and uh, ask your uh, questions. Um, let me just get the list up. So, and Chimi from Zambia has a couple. Uh, so, and Chimi, you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yes. Um, Peter, you mentioned that uh, the antenna should not be exposed to to to, to water or, or rain on rain. I was just wondering what the effect um, of how of mount, mounting the antenna in an area where you have some transparent material such as glass on top there would be on the on the attenuation of the or, or, I mean how significant the attenuation of the signal would be if you were to do that in order to have an opportunity of looking at the sky um, without uh, damaging your antenna? Well, that's a very good question, Jimmy. I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a perfect thing for me to be able to uh, go and test. <clears throat> I was assuming it's all going to be out in the open. I don't know the effect, the RF effect of, uh, of, a, of sheets of glass. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I know what the effect of plastic is, which is nothing, uh, largely at these frequencies, but I do not know the effect of glass. 
So it's something uh, that's something I never thought of. Um, and uh, so that's a challenge to, uh, when I found out the answer, I'll put that in the script, of course. Thank or, you. Uh, People could try the experiment themselves, I guess. If you yeah, just but it'd be, it'd be, it's, it might be, it might be tricky. I think it's important I try that myself. Yeah. I mean, if you certainly if you put it inside, uh, if you cover it with uh, plastic, for example, or if you just stop the antenna, put a plastic bag over it, that will have no effect at all. If you try to do it inside a classroom, uh, then that might be different. But I will, I will try that. But a plastic bag will will be fine. I mean, there, <clears throat> there is no. Um, safety issues really um because the 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 voltage is a the voltage is low voltage and it's done by a professional transformer but uh, not a good idea to work in the rain <clears throat> if you get rain inside the antenna it can affect the matching um and so that would that's definitely not a good idea but it's not really a safety issue uh it's just a it's just a quality of data issue Okay. Good question. I don't know the answer. First, first one has floored me. <laughs> Sounds like you were planning to uh, do the observations next to Victoria Falls, and Chimi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, then the other one. Went I near the we went to Victoria Falls, and it was completely wonderful. About two years ago. Oh yeah, you're welcome to come again. <laughs> <laughs> it was fabulous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is this software. Is it only? Windows based, yeah, uh, or is there, is there the, an equivalent, um, an alternative one for Linux or something? I don't believe there is. I'm, I'm only, this is only for Windows. So, one thing that might help there, and Jimmy, is um, obviously, you know, we've already, Dara's already sent the optical telescope uh, to each country. Um, and we have the CCD and the laptop ready to ship out to accompany those optical telescopes now as well. In fact, they yes. obviously the, everything's stopped since uh, COVID, of course, but um, but they're basically sitting in the office next door to me, ready to be shipped. So the okay. the laptop that goes with the optical telescope is a Windows laptop, and so you could use the same laptop to run the uh, one of these radio telescopes as you could to. Uh, to deal with the uh, optical telescopes as well, so. Okay, thank you. So hopefully you can you, use, use those. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can use, <clears throat> you can use any, old, any old laptop, but I was nearly, most people's common or garden laptops are used for, for, um, for writing Word and other boring stuff are Windows-based, so any of those will be fine. It doesn't require power. It's, very, it's a very low power application. I mean, low okay. computing power, that is. Thank you. Thanks, Sunshimi. Um, Patrick, you've got a question. Where have you gone? Oh, there you are. Uh, Patrick, do you want to unmute and ask your question? OK. My question is, uh, how much is the cost of uh, the ZD software? Is it uh, free or? Uh, how much does it cost? All this software is free. So that's just supplied with the, all, this, all the software that comes with this experiment is, is supplied on a pen drive that comes with it. You just, it's, all, it's all open source. Sorry, Patrick, you no broke problem. up that. Yeah, I've noted. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, all you have to bring to this experiment is a, 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 a ropey old laptop running Windows. Yep. Or oh, there may be there okay. may be there may be a lab one, but uh, anybody's anybody's ordinary laptop will work. Yeah, that's good because we also okay. plan up more than you know. We're going to make twenty of these, so there's, there's in countries like Kenya and and Ghana, etc. There'll certainly be more than one uh, shipped out so that uh, you know different universities and institutions can kind of have a go so the point it, it doesn't require a specialized dedicated uh, computer to go with it it's just any old any old uh, cheap laptop yeah okay thank you okay um 
Solomon has a question. So Solomon, do you want to ask? Yeah. Solomon, you should be able to unmute yourself now, I think. Mm -hmm. how good your audio is. Or I can ask it for you if you like. So Solomon has a question particular to him because he's been helping out with the Ghana Planetarium. And uh, so he's asking if, uh, you know, an organization like the Planetarium could order an antenna like this and do its own radio astronomy work. Um, yeah, no worries, Solomon. Um, or maybe collaborations to set up a radio astronomy center using this antenna at private institutions, that kind of thing. Well, we'd be supplying, I mean, <clears throat> I think I'm going to get fed up of making uh, enough of these antennas, but the, the design can be freely available. It's a, it's a pretty trivial design. And the software is free, you see. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of the cleverness is in the, um, a lot of the of the technical cleverness is in the dongle which you just buy for twenty five dollars, um, and the little box is trivial. You could be uh, that's all commercial equipment, and even even with the filter, you can probably buy a Chinese one, but won't be quite as good. Um, one thing you could do, I'm just thinking about how people might want to improve this setup and. Uh, so the simplest possible setup can, as you can see, can see the hydrogen quite nicely <clears throat> and can, uh, and it, I thought it's very good to keep things very simple in the first instance. But what you could do, if you had a bigger dish, for example, around, you could, um, you could take the, turn the antenna upside down, um, possibly even, which would be very easy, take the, uh, take the ice cream cone off, the cone part, and use the uh, use the um, the cantenna as what's called the feed for a, a bigger dish. Um, so that would be another way of using it. But uh, I wanted to make not I wanted to make it so you didn't have to get complicated. You could literally students could do something from a desktop. Yeah. And as soon as you, of course, having to get when you start having bigger dishes, you have to worry about pointing the dish more accurately at the degree level or sub-degree level. Um, the whole business gets more complicated. This was a, um, this is something that can be done with um, minimum uh, complication. No, oh, well, that's interesting to know though. So in, I mean, maybe there's sort of two ideas strike me here is that as well as the kind of manual in a sense, you could also have a, a sort of a design manual in a sense that people could if they wanted to make it themselves and that might satisfy some people perhaps i've written these notes down i've got so far i've written down glass effect question mark <laughs> linux question mark and design manual so yeah. that's what i and um and i no, i quite like i mean we've had quite a lot of questions in the past of you know places with small dishes or satellite dishes and, and whether they can be uh, turned into something. And so your idea of, you know, using it as a feed for one of those might. Well, uh, you see, Evan, nothing else would change. That's the beauty of that. You oh, could, well, that'd be good. Nothing else, nothing else would change. I mean, the, the receiving equipment, yeah. um, all you'd need is a longer, longer wire from the back of the box to your yeah. laptop, to the, to the dongle. That's all you'd need. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be exactly the same, and you just get uh, you just get higher quality spectra if you had a dish. Yeah, if someone's got a three meter dish, then uh, that'd be good. Yeah. yeah, you didn't even. I mean, at Jodrell, you see, we've got bits of old old telescopes sitting up, sitting upside down. You could arrange a. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a complicated pointing arrangement because you could sort of move the dish to a particular point in the sky by manually and take a spectrum. You, it would be wonderful to have a wonderful uh, um, Azel com computer controlled dish, but it's not necessary. You could uh, you could make a dish 
one or one meter across, for example. Yeah. Um, you get very nice results from a one and a half meter dish, I can tell you, because I had students doing that. Using, indeed, using the uh, the antenna as a feed. Yeah, well, so I'm thinking that, you know, especially with like university projects and that kind of thing, if they want to so get- So you could, you could, in fact, that was an interesting point. You could, in fact, suggest it, because it's making a dish. Either you can steal one or a satellite one, or you can actually make one. It's not very difficult. As long as you're just const constructing something a meter across, uh, you could make a satellite dish out of a bit of chicken wire. And anyway, that's that would be a, that would be another experiment. And um, the beauty of it is that the, the the feed and the beam pattern of the um, cantenna part, if you, if you take off the, the horn, is almost exactly suitable for a common or garden dish. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put that down as well as. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, you know, it's kind of the thing we're trying to do is, you know, with the optical telescope and now with the tabletop radio telescope is to to give a set of kit that can be used for certainly for undergraduate training and experiments and projects and that kind of thing. Um, and so to help help with the development of teaching there, astronomy. Yeah, I think there are many places which will have uh, spare satellite dishes yeah. as long as it's as long as it's um, uh, significantly bigger than uh, than say 60 to 80 centimeters, 60 centimeters would still be good. Yeah. Um, then you'd get a, you'd get improved results by using it as a feed rather than directly as a horn. Yeah. Um, Sigrid, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? You should be able to unmute. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Prof. Peter, for your presentation. That was, uh, in fact, very. Um, informative well, i don't know I, I just felt like i was part of the experiment already um anyways my question is um it seems like with all the data that you have collected um so far or you have um shown to us this was all done right in the in the northern hemisphere right or did you also no, no, that my house is my, my house is firmly in the northern hemisphere. Uh, okay, so will there any will there be any difference due to geographical? Um, um, oh sphere? yes, well no, you, you you lucky people in in Africa can okay. see the cent around the center of the galaxy. You can see um, um, interesting parts of the galactic plane are much easier to see from from there. So you should get some nice results. But so you can see that. nice results. From, you can see nice results from the UK. Uh, unfortunately, my garden is surrounded by trees, so it's been quite difficult. I've been uh, getting a lot of comments from the streets. I've been having to go to the uh, to my garden gate into the road with the antenna there, and uh, a lot of our neighbours now know about the Dara project. Oh wow, that's good. <laughs> All right. So you get to, you should get some you should get some lots of nice results from. Uh, uh, sites in Africa, uh, more equatorial sites rather than way up in the north. <clears throat> the Galactic okay. Center, for example, is very difficult to see from from us. Okay, all right, yeah, that's one of the questions. The next question I wanted to also find out. Um, you said you mentioned that you're going to give every collaborating university at least one or two. Um, um, this TTRP, um, TTR, what? TTRT, sorry. TTRT, Tabletop Radio yes. Telescope. Yes, you're definitely going to give them. So this, and you're going to expect them to give you some of the reports or results. Well, it would be good. To, or, well, uh, no, it's, it's for you, to, it's for the, it's the student to, uh, and hopefully, um, with uh, local supervisors, <clears throat> but it would be very good, for example, on the DARA website to have uh, people's reports being posted. That would be that would be lovely because then other people can learn from them. Okay, um, but it's, it's, it's not it's not being DARA isn't. We're not marking them. We're just uh, we'd love to see them and to comment yeah. on them. Then everybody can gain from everybody else's experience. Okay, you just broke me to the correct point. Thank you. Um, and the next. The last point I think I have is, does or does do our offer still stand? Um, 
I last asked you if it's possible that you actually send a TTRT um, down to the south as well for our DARA training unit two, three, four, um, at least to present. Does that still, does that offer still stand? Just to feel, see it? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to, now that I've got the, uh, now that I've got the uh, prototype, <clears throat> I'm pretty well sorted out exactly how the prototype is. Okay. As I say, a little bit of tweaking, we're going to build 20 of these. They'll be handed around, um, however, however um, the PI thinks fit. Well, I think Sigrid's question was more, are we going to bring it along to the unit two, three training when it, when it eventually yes. happens? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, oh and okay. I think that's, sorry, that's absolutely critical because <clears throat> that will be the first, the last part of the testing, the prototyping, <clears throat> because there's nothing like students to find out what you've got wrong or how you can misunderstand things. So I've been confusing myself for the past few months, trying different ways to run this experiment. and now think I've got the right way to run the experiment, <clears throat> but there's nothing like having um, students uh, using it. So very much so, um, it's a critical part. And I was hoping, I was hoping to do that for units two and three in, uh, in Ghana this year. Um, I know you mentioned Ghana, but we're right in the south. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, so that's in Ghana and South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so indeed, indeed, uh, I won't be there, but uh, the, the idea is one will be there, and okay. with this, um, with this um, uh, e-seminar, yes. and with the in, with the instruction book, and of course, no doubt a Zoom, uh, you should be able to use it just as well. And of course, the beauty these days is that uh, if students uh, get into trouble, or not trouble, but uh, get confused, uh, it's easy to ask questions um, on the web or in the end via Zoom. So you could, uh, you won't be on your own, or students won't be on their own. But I'm hoping that with this um, seminar, the two seminars, and with the instruction book, then it should be clear enough. The main thing is to not to point through trees and near walls. <laughs> That's about the biggest thing to avoid. Try and get a clear line of sight to the sky. Great. Thank Thanks. you, Phil. Thanks, Sigrid. Um, I think, you know, similarly to the optical telescope, we'll probably set up a, another Facebook group for, the, for these uh, TTRTs once they're deployed so that the people who are kind of looking after them will be able to, you know, swap notes and talk to each other uh, via a Facebook group um, so that people can learn from each other as, as they develop things and post results and, and things there. But like I said, you know, having, getting pictures of students and, and even outreach events using this stuff would be, would be fantastic for Dara. So that would be really good. Um, just a couple of clarifying questions from me, uh, Peter. Um, you, <laughs> One possible confusing thing is is how to define azimuth, uh, because probably astronomers and terrestrial people do it differently. But what's your definition of azimuth in your manual? Uh, well, not degrees is north. Yeah, which way is which? Ninety degrees is east. Okay, so it's east of north. Well, <laughs> you'll now confuse me now, but uh, it's it's clearly it's clearly it's what a compass is. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Okay. Compass yeah. direction. Right. Compass directions. Yeah. And it'll yeah. be defined. It'll be defined. Google Google Earth Pro is a fantastic thing to have because that tells you. Yeah. So like a bearing. Yeah. Like a bearing. Yes. Right. I'm with you now. Yeah. It's compass bearing. Yeah. Well, I was. Google Earth Pro is, uh, is, is and the ruler on that is fantastically useful and stop you getting any confusion. Yeah, well, I'm always confused because we're always doing it in our own deck, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering whether it would be a good idea, you know, if people want to do a lot of different azimuth directions, um, you know, it would be sensible to try and get up on a roof somewhere and set it up that way so you've got a clear sight of the horizon if it's safe. Oops, 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 sorry, I'm just knocked my, just knocked my, my mouse off. Um, yeah, yeah, roof is good, except if you go to the roof, for example, in the um, 
TU, uh, TUK building in, in uh, Nairobi, all you see are other roofs much taller than you. So yep. the roof in uh, Technical University physics building would be useless. Right. So, well, not useless. No, that's not quite true. That's not quite true. But there would still be quite a few buildings around you. And the, the other trouble there is some of the buildings very close to you have um, have massive amounts of uh, radio frequency emission. Now, whether the filter would work, it probably would, but um, uh, yeah, roof rooftops in principle are good as long as you're not surrounded by other skyscrapers. Yeah, or transmitters. <laughs> or transmitters. It should be okay because this is a very very good filter. Yeah. Sp Dara has spent the money on a very good filter. Glad to hear it. Because that's, a, that's another thing that would completely ruin it. If you didn't have that good filter in, the mobile phones completely smash the uh, amplifiers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think my final question, because I, I mean, when I've done bits of, you know, single dish spectral line stuff in the past, then we would usually do what, do a kind of a quotient, if you know what I mean. So we would, you know, you'd take an on spectrum of, where you are and then maybe like for this thing you could point up at the galactic poles and and get a, a spectrum with hardly any hydrogen in it uh, but still the same sky and then you'd subtract off the sky and then divide by the sky but yeah that... it, it doesn't it doesn't work very well because there's 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 hydrogen everywhere you see you really can't yeah. get an you can't get an off spectrum yeah, even okay. though there's less of it it's it would be and it would be at a different frequency yeah. so that's why you have to do this absolute comparison compared to a load Right. You can't do the normal as you would do for a discrete object. Yeah, you can point off to a bit of sky where there's no there's no line. It doesn't work so well for hydrogen. No, I assume that would be the case. But yeah, great. However, people might find all sorts of interesting ways to do it. I've just developed the simplest way to get you started to see some three or four spectra on the plane and one at higher latitudes. And you'd get a hell of a lot out of the experiment if you did just that. But I'm sure there's more you can do. <laughs> we'll be into frequency switching in a minute, but let's not go there. <laughs> well, you could do that. No, yeah. You could certainly do that because yeah. yeah. you can change the frequency. I deliberately didn't do that. No. You can change the frequency just with software. Exactly. No, it'd be interesting. So lots of extensions as well. So we've got a good, a good basis for a lot of uh, proper hands-on radio astronomy here, which is great. So... Um, I think we'll, we'll end there. Um, many thanks, Peter, for taking the time. I mean, obviously not just in these two e-seminars, but all the effort and time that you've put in uh, uh, getting everything ready and um, over, the, over the years now, really. Um, and so we'll, as we... Well, I can honestly say it has been and is continuing to be a pleasure. Yeah. Because I can just see, I just want to see students seeing, seeing hydrogen for the first time. Yep. All the four students I've I've had working on this experiment previously, seeing hydrogen for the first time, they all go, "Ooh, wow! There's something there. Wow! There's something <laughs> there. That's our galaxy." And yeah. this funny little bit of equipment picks yeah. it up. Gosh, yep. that'll be really <laughs> great. We definitely look forward to that. Um, so many thanks, Peter. Um, again, many thanks to everyone for for coming along. Um, <coughs> We're, as I said, this is the last one this year. Um, I'm going to sort of pause the series uh, until we find out a bit more about what's happening with the sort of extension to the to the Dara project or not. Um, so we're we're still waiting to hear from our funders on that. Um, so there's a bit of uncertainty around at the moment, but once we uh, once we know what's happening, uh, we'll be back in touch to let you know. And um, the lockdowns will continue for a while um, and so we'll I'm sure we'll continue uh, at least in the UK they will and uh, so we'll continue uh, the series after after Christmas in the new year and uh, so we look forward to uh, seeing you again then uh, in the meantime uh, have a good break everyone and a Merry Christmas bye 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 thanks